Okay. Uh, one of the things I want to mention to you is this demonstration or this YouTube, um, which is uh, kind of a, a mashup of uh, an old film, uh, a video of a film from the 1960s of these gray and, and black and white lines that you see. Um, it's uh, from a series of films on waves. And then those two kind of dots in the middle are meant to uh, symbolize the sources of two sets of spherical wave trains. And so that's like for us the the uh, S1 and S2 in the, in the double uh, slit experiment. And what we're going to talk about today is the, you can see here that the grayish lines, you, you see alternating bright, dark, bright, dark, and they come out in kind of rays that expand outward. And then in between them, you see a kind of a gray zone. Now the gray is um, flat water. That's destructive interference. In the middle of the bars is uh, constructive interference, and that's where your bright spots would be. And then your dark spots uh, would be out in the direction of the uh, of the gray areas, the flat water. All right, so we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Can you switch over to laptop now? Um, I just want you to see that. Oh, gosh, this is good. Well, I hope that doesn't mess up. Let me stop the. Okay. So, uh, so anyways, we're going to talk about resonance and containment uh, in our discussion today. And then the Balmer series uh, for hydrogen, which you can see there in the, in the opening slide, the hydrogen spectrum. And then we're going to talk about Max Planck and quant the idea of quantization. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about the grades update that I did yesterday. Now we still have a total points basis of 156. The only thing that we've done is update the, uh, well, let me go through the updates here. Um, I updated the classwork pointage, including Wednesday's clicking. Okay, I did that yesterday. So now that's down here in classwork pointage. Uh, a classwork score as of November 20. So remember, I turn your classwork score into classwork pointage. And, uh, and uh, that goes into your bundle of 156 or fewer points. Uh, homework scores, uh, those are still good. All right, so we, we haven't had any change on that, so that's the same as it has been. So this is for an uh, example student, John Q. student. Uh, yours will look a little bit like this. A little bit further down the page um, are the best two out of three midterms. They're not in this view, but they're down with the exam scores. And we've already had, we've had that for about a week as well. Um, now, um, the total points is now up to date. All right. So this is an eyeball of your letter grade, or excuse me, this can give you an eyeball on your letter grade um, going pretty much going into the final, All right? So here's what those, here's what the pointage values would be. 141 points or more, A. Um, 117 points or more, B. Uh -huh, 94 points or more, C. Uh, 78 points or more, D. And fewer than 78 is an F. Well, that's supposed to be an F. Sorry, I didn't change that. Uh, that's the letter E. But anyways, um, here's the estimated grades that we've got right now. So nobody even has a D in here. Going into the final. Now, uh, my word of caution to you, everybody in here is at least a C. All right? There's not many A's, though. So still, that's, you know, still, it's still tough to get an A in here. But my word of uh, admonition is we still have clicking. We're going to do some clicking today. All right. 
so your home, so your classwork pointage might change. We're going to have some homework. Okay. And of course, we have the final exam, and that's a big bindle of 84 points, and that'll bring us all the way up to 240 after the final. So for until the final, this is our points basis, all right? So this is going to be fair. You know, we're not going to do a whole lot of clicking. So your clicking pointage might, even though the total might change, your scores, uh, your, you know, when I convert it to something out of 36, it might not change a whole lot. Uh, so this is going to be fairly good uh, going into the final. Now, uh, we're probably going to dismiss a little early today. And for this reason, so that you can spend some time here, and I'll, I'll just sit down at one of the tables and go over your grades with you if you want to, all right? Which I know a lot of people get nervous about their grades and stuff, and, you know, where, where do I stand right now? And if this is not enough for you, then we can go over your uh, grades and stuff. Uh, and I'll look at the, you know, I'll try to look at everything with you. Uh, but questions for right now. Yes. The question was, when will the extra credit be going in? There's already, uh, that's an important question. All this here that I, you know, the, your total points update doesn't include any bonus points. Now there's already some bonus points on the, on the books from early iClicker registration. All right. There's the bonus points. Uh, I think it's three points from that survey that I, we asked you to take. And I'm sorry, but that lady told me that I would have the data by last Friday. See, I got to, apparently I have to upload it. She thought it was supposed to download into web courses automatically, but Canvas is kind of scratchy when it comes to cooperating with other computer systems. It's either Canvas's way or the highway. But she's going to give me that data and as, in a spreadsheet, and I'll upload it for you. So that's still to come, and it might not happen until after the final. Who knows when these guys are going to come up with it. Um, but you'll get it. Don't, don't worry about that. Also, I have this big, lovely pile of of grades uh, of uh, bonus point uh, from a bonus problem for homework t from exam two is still sitting on my desk at home. I've been avoiding it uh, assiduously the last, I've been pretty good at avoiding it too, but I still got to finish all of those and get those out. So maybe I'll be able to do it this weekend if, if the cows come home, but until the cows come home, it's, it's it's kind of iffy. So there's that bonus pointage. Now, shh, 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 shh. the last day of class, we usually have a little, I, have, I think I've mentioned this in here, kind of a in-class review sheet that you click in at your own pace with your neighbors and work on problems. And I'll convert that into like two or three bonus points, possibly one, two or three, maybe four bonus points. And then I'll have a big mega review homework inside web courses so that if you miss the class, the last day of classes, you can still bag some bonus points from a big mega review in web courses. And hopefully you can get both. Uh, so we got, we got bonus points, but Heidi, the thing is, bonus points are the least of my worries. And I usually... I uh, don't round. I, I usually don't put them in, in, in your grade book so that you can see them until like. And, and we have an early final, so it's it's probably going to be after the final. But who knows? I, wait a minute. We got Thanksgiving. And I don't need a real life. I don't need. You know, so. So I can dedicate myself. Yeah, right. So anyways, maybe over the Thanksgiving holiday, I'll have some time to do that. Cassidy. Cassidy has a very good question. The final exam will be 75% new or what? 
Well, I would love to answer that question. And here's how I shall answer it. I'm not going to tell you what's going to be on the file, but I will, I will say, nice try. Uh, I will say that it's going to be cumulative, including the stuff that we've been doing since exam three and up until Wednesday's lecture. Now, Wednesday's not going to be ginormous for lecture because we're going to do half lecture and then half review, but, but yeah, it's going to be cumulative and, and, Oh, uh, I mean the Wednesday before finals. That's two. Yeah, we do. We have that class. We have Monday and Wednesday uh, before finals week. Yeah, Maria. I can't hear you. The final? Another good question. Is it, is it all multiple choice? The answer to that is... A secret. But I'm but I will tell tell you what I'm inclined to do and to not do. I'm inclined not to do any written problems on the final. Okay, because it's but what I am inclined to do is some clicking calculations on the final. So those of you with so those of you with clicker problems uh and I, I see the uh, one student with clicker problem is not here. But if 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 I do, and I'll I'll try to let you know before the final, of course, what I do. But it's going to be mostly multiple choice. You know, like all my exams, it's double the size of a midterm, and we have about three times as much time to do it. So it should be fairly righteous. And as always, there'll be some formula matching to start. And it won't be all the formulas that you have, but it will be the formulas that you need in the matching area. So I got to write all the tests first and then leave, you know, seven or eight matching problems for formulas and figure out what to put in there. And, and it will. As I have mentioned in the past. Uh, one of the tasks in here is to uh, think. So you have exam three. So, so go ahead and memorize that if you want. It's not going to help you. If, if you want to want to know what's not going to be on the exam, it's any of those questions. All right. So another, but you may see something similar to that, but significantly changed. Okay, it may be reminiscent, but not identical. We've covered a lot of different things, and we're, we're closing out with a little bit of quantum physics starting today. We're starting out, we're, we're going to talk about Max Planck and the quantum theory of uh, oscillation. But one of the ways that, you know, people find it hard to, to think is to take two disparate topics and combine them to solve some third problem, right? And that's a challenge, right? That's called in, in the education department across campus, they would call that synthesis, right? Now this class, we have a huge range of topics. And so the opportunities for forcing you to synthesize a solution with an exam question, a brain burn, it, you know, that's an, that's an automatic recipe for a brain burner, Maria. All right. So you're, there's a good chance that you'll see at least one or two problems of that nature. And also, uh, you know, for that problem, for that, uh, as far as that goes, multiple choice questions, I can make those synthesis type problems as well, but multiple choice. So you can Christmas tree the, 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 the exam and, and maybe get some of those synthesis multiple choice questions right. But in no way can you do it if I give you a calculation that makes you put things together. All right.
Another question. Okay. Um, uh, my last comment on all that is we'll continue to talk about the finals between now and the end of the semester. And by the way, if you don't, if you don't, I, I saw a couple of people here in class when I said that we had Wednesday before finals week or Wednesday of the beginning of finals week lecture, they didn't believe, they went like that and like they didn't believe me. And then they looked, apparently they were looking something up. And the way that I go, I just go by the registrar's website, registrar.ucf.edu, and then I look at the academic calendar. And you'll see it all there. You know, we don't have a study day this year. And, uh, you know, and here's the weird part. We're finishing pretty, pretty late because we started late in August. It, well, the hurricane doesn't affect finals week, unless it cancels finals week, God forbid. But... We, we, so far, we haven't been that lucky. <laughs> we've had we've had hurricanes that cancel any number of different parts of a semester, but by golly, never finals week. We, we got to get get those hurricanes, get them with the program. Anyway, so we'll keep talking about it. And you guys are under the gun. I mean, we go the second day of finals week, so Friday. First day is third. We have so we have our last lecture on Wednesday. Then the first day of finals is Thursday, and then the second day of finals at 7 a.m. is this one. Mika, you got to be here. And there's no newbie. You know, I don't think there's any newbie freshman in here. But if you, oddly, you're not. Don't smile. You're not a newbie. Do you feel like one though? If you newbie freshmen are notorious for blowing the 7 a.m. finals, okay, you know, like the dog ate their alarm clock and all that kind of nonsense, you know, they were kidnapped by aliens or you know some weird theory. But, but you guys, I expect you to be mature and organized. Get a couple alarm. Can't come on. Yes, yes. Say yes. I am. Just say it five times a day. I am organized. I am organized. You got to be because seven and final. If you're not here on time, you, you know you're toast. You won't be able to take it. All right. We'll keep talking more about that as we go through the, the last few lectures. This is session 38, by the way. We got another three, and we got one on Monday, and then two the week after that. Now. Last time we did some sketching, basically we did this one. And notice that this has the squiggle in it that I made. But th this one um, up here in the, in, the, in the right side where it hits the screen, it has the two rays converging to a point. Now, I kind of sidestepped that issue. I aimed it up there, and I said, well, we'll just consider it as meeting at the same point for constructive interference. But this one puts in a squiggle like I did, but it doesn't it doesn't have um, over here. This is at the actual physical. This is physically what happens. OK, and I want to go over that with you now. So I want you to take some careful notes. Go ahead and make a sketch. Uh, we're going to talk about a barrier like this with some plane waves. And we'll just say there's 633 nanometers, some red uh, laser plane waves. So we put them through a. A couple lenses, we flatten out the wave fronts, and uh, they're nice and coherent. And they're going through a barrier with two gaps in it. And as with all barriers, you know, you're going to have two wavelet sources in the gaps. Now, here's one of the wavelet sources and a bunch of waves. Now, I made all these circles and all the plane waves six, uh, 30 pixels apart, all right? So the wavelength is 30 pixels. So make your circles concentric and evenly spaced. 
make your plain waves. You know, you can use notebook paper for the in the lines of your notebook paper for plane waves. But the circles, now, you know what? Just try to trace two or three of these and then view what I've got. Because this is really hard to do nicely. Anyways, over in your other gap, you've got another source. All right. So this is kind of how we we mock up the true geometry of the bright spots. Now, on this diagram, the red circle or the red lines represent wavefronts. So we'll say that those are the peaks of the electric field at a, sna a snapshot of time, at an instant of time, all right? So wherever you see two of the red circular ones uh, cross, one from source one, one from source two, then that's a constructive interference. So make a note. I didn't put it on here, but I'm verbally giving you this. So put it over the side somewhere. Where the circles cross, constructive interference. All right? And in fact, um, you can get, uh, here's, here, I just blobbed in this yellow dot. Now look at my cursor. Check my cursor. All right, check the cursor. Check the cursor. Right, my cursor is at that yellow dot. Now that's where two of the circles intersect. So that's a bright spot. If you were there, you'd see a bright spot. And if you put a film, a little tiny piece of film there, you'd get an exposure. You'd get a dot of some kind or a bar, a bright strip. All right. Now, if you think, if you look at this, uh, this one is one lambda away from S2. This is S2 down here. All right, and this is S1. So let's see the intersecting circle. One, two, three, fourth circle out from S1. And first circle out from S2. So that means that right in here, uh, delta L is three lambda. All right. That circle from source two it's fairly small. It's three lambda behind the circle that it intersects with at that point. All right. Now, there's another three lambda dot right up here. All right now, now watch what I do. It's, I'm going to fade it in. All right. There it is. Let me move my arrow. Okay. All right. So there's another three lambda bright spot. And you now I'm gonna fade out my arrow. And I'm gonna put in some more. And now these are yellow. All right, here's the next one. All right now, look at that. And they're just beaming off in a certain direction. And that's kind of like that image that I showed you from YouTube, the water waves. All right. So there's a bunch. So it, and so you can get from that that row of dots, the yellow dots. That's uh, third order. That's your third order bright spot off in that direction. All right. Now don't label it m equals three uh, unless you can't. I, well, you know, you make a judgment. I didn't put any of that in there. All right. Now, so that's. That's everything. All these yellow ones, starting with this first one, are three lambda behind source one. Okay, so whatever source two puts out here is three lambda behind uh, source two. Now, if I go over to this, this dot right here, all right, this one, now this is a, a bluish dot. It doesn't look very blue, it looks almost black here, but. Uh, on vi on the YouTube, it'll look blue. This one here, this is M equals 2, all right? Because, look, it's still on the first circle of source 2, but it's on the 1, 2, 3. It's on the third circle of source 1. So that means you're, you're, uh, it's two wavelengths behind. Now, I'm not going to draw that in, but you can make a note. But I am going to draw on these other dots. So here they come. 
Here's another one right here. Here's another one right up here. Here's another one right up here. Here's another one right up here. And here's another one. All right, so this is this is m equals two. These blue ones. All right, now I've got it. You can see I've got another one coming. All right, but that's m equals two. And in between, so in between the dots, pretty much straight in between them, like, like look at where my cursor is here, okay? This is between the second and the third dots of M equals two. That's going to be a bright spot as well. So that's what that is. That's the middle of a, a blank and a, for, for each circle. So the blank, the white area, is the trough. The middle of the white area is the trough. The red area is the crest. Okay, so I've got dots where the crests are, so halfway between the crests. So those are the rogue waves if you're thinking about water waves. Okay, so halfway between the rogue waves is a, do a doubly deep trough. Okay, that's where my cursor is. All right, but that was still, but it's still just double magnitude. Okay, if, you know, so, uh, so it's doubly deep uh, trough, and the blue dots are doubly high. Uh, peaks in the electric field. All right, now let me pause for questions. CJ. Everywhere along where the where the dots are, so just kind of eyeball in a graceful line between the dots. All right, and everywhere along that line, you're going to have it's not all crest, but it's all going to be constructive interference. Now, here's another thing. Halfway between the dots, between the yellow and the blue, destructive. So, so like right here where my cursor is, all right, I'm on a crest from source two. But I'm in the middle of a trough from source one. So that's flat water right there. Now, I'm not going to sketch that in. But you know how you could do this? You could do this nicely on graph paper if you also have a compass, you know, a circle maker. You could do this yourself, and you could make the wavelength anything you like. And do and that's basically what I did. I mean, I used the circle maker in uh, Apple Keynote for this. All right, let's get M equals 1. All right, so that's going to be this dot right here. Now, here I'm going to click, and I'm going to animate it. Here it comes. Oh, no, it's down here, this green one. All right, so this is the green one. It's on the right. It's on the first circle from S2, and it's on the one, two. It's on the second circle from source uh, one. All right, so that means it's n equal. It's m equals one. It's delta L is one lambda. And here's a bunch more. Here's one right here. Here they come. All right, and I'm just going to click them into existence. And wherever my circles cross, I get. So, CJ, in between the green dots, on a line between those, is a bright spot. On a line between the blue and the green, or between the blue and the yellow, halfway through there, um, flat water, a dark spot, right? Now, M equals zero is the central image, the central bright spot. So that's right down the pipe. That's an easy one. Here it is, right? And that's the one where you're, the circle number or the wave number from each of the sources is the same. So, so right here, I didn't put any dots here. I just put the straight line. Right here where my cursor is, that's the second wave out from, the, from each source. Okay, so this is the symmetry line. All right, and it's right down the pipe. Now notice if if wave was not if light was not a wave 
you wouldn't see Jack right there. If, if light was just uh, particles of light going along rays, that's in the shadow zone. All right. So as, uh, as Professor Arago said, um, I got it. He, he would get this in heart. Actually, Thomas Young's the one that got this. You know, this is his famous double slit experiment. You know, so that's not predicted. All right. Now, as I was mentioning to CJ and to everyone, the line um, that you draw between the dots uh, will give you an indication of where the bright spots are. You know, other than, you know, the, the dots tell you that. And if you want somewhere that's not one of the dots, just draw a line. Now, here's a line that goes between the first two dots, the first two green dots. Now, this is M equals 1. But if you look at it, take a look at it carefully. Take a look at it, right? It kind of veers off to the left. It, it connects the first two dots, but it doesn't connect that last dot. It's off the line, that last one. All right, let's check the second. Let's try M equals 2. We'll connect the first two dots of M equal 2. Oh, we're a little bit off the pitch. Let's try M equals. Whoop. We're off the pitch there. All right. Now, the circles tell the tale. The circles are wave fronts from the two wavelet sources. So we don't go by the lines in this diagram because we got the circles, and the circles can tell the tale. All right. So let me now take out my wavelet sources and let's just look at the dots and stuff, All right? Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove my set, my two sets of circles because they've done their work. All right. All right. That's source one. Here's source two out. Now here's my central maximum M equals zero. Here's M equals one. And now it's even clearer that, this straight line that connects the first two dots for M equals one, it doesn't dip. So CJ, what this is doing, if you draw a line segment between consecutive green dots, you'll get a curve. It looks pretty close to a straight line, but it's not. It'll be a little bit curvaceous, all right? So make a big note to yourself. When you're in close like this, the true optics are not straight line sets of constructive interference points. It's going to be a slightly curved. And if I recall correctly, they're hyperbola. So, in, so here's my uh, lesson to you. In close, the true optics, i.e. the dots, they don't follow straight lines. You can see them on this, all right? Now, the reason for that is we're getting good diffraction. But guess what? The area that we're looking at, unfortunately, is very, very close to the apparatus. So I'm definitely not in the squiggle zone here. I'm way before the squiggles. I'm in close, okay? But if you're far away, if, you're, if, you're far, if your screen is way on the other side of the squiggles, you know, way out there, you're going to see d sine theta equals m lambda, right, for theta. Now, so, so this one, so this one, uh, sine theta, you know, theta for each of these dots is not the same. The reason for that is they're, those red lines are different. They're, they don't – the red lines all have the same tilt angle theta, but the dots don't. So in close, this is what you – this is what you call uh, – this is true for all electromagnetic radiation. If you're close to the radio state – oh, by the way, if you've ever seen a radio station that has two two big antennas, this is what they're doing. 
they're beaming their radio uh, program, you know, perpendicular to the the, the direction of, of the uh, the two antennas. They're beaming a lot. So in, in this case, it'd be up and down if you had two uh, radio way, two radio towers where our two slat uh, our two uh, gaps are. Okay, so they so like when, when I was growing up in New Jersey, we had this uh, one station WABC. 77 and a, a bunch of other really powerful radio stations like uh wnbc 66 660 that was clear channel and clear channel means no other con no other radio station in the united states can have that frequency so wnbc in new york clear channel all the way across the united states and they could beam they, and so those those radio stations would have their transmitters out in New Jersey. Um, and so some of them that were just broadcasting locally in the New York City area, they used the, the Empire State Building or the, the World Trade Center. Uh, but a lot of them had, and they would, you could hear their, their radio program all the way to Canada. And I remember one time I was camping out up in the mountains of Virginia, way down there, it's, well, way up there in South Virginia, up in the hills, and I had a little radio with me, and I turned it on. I was listening to the, and it was dark. It was this time of year, and I was freezing my, you know what, off. But I could still hear the radio. It was like six at night, and I turned it on. I could, see, I could listen to uh, CBS, New York City, eighty-eight, eight eighty, uh, kilocycles. I could listen to the, the news and the traffic from New York City all the way down to like five hundred miles away in Virginia. It was spectacular. But that's because they were transmitting like this. And every, you know, every once in a while, if I'm, I'm, if I got nothing else to do and I'm just waiting for somebody, I'll turn on the AM radio in my car, see if I can catch any of the New York stations. Sometimes you can get Chicago, different, you know, sometimes Nashville, depending. And it's because of the ionosphere. So these two zones, you know, in close and out in the squiggle land, uh, those are two, what we would call, out there in the squiggle land is what we would call the radiation zone. And in close, we would call it, what do you call that? What does Jackson call it? In close to the sources? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, they have another word for the in close. We'll just call it in close. Um, I'll look it up over the weekend. But, uh So this is a reminder that the sizes are important. Now, I got some clicker questions for you. Go ahead and turn on your clicker. Let's talk about sizes. Wavelengths, gaps. And notice here that the gaps are a few times bigger than the wavelengths. Mm, maybe two times bigger than the wavelength. All right. Now, a clicker question. Let me get my cursor over here. All right, turn your clicker on. We're going to do multiple choice. Uh, clicker question number one. So this is a completely different example here. D dots lambda. I hear calculators coming out. Brad, can I see your calculator?
Bring your bread. Ten seconds starting now. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a ratio of 10,000 to 1, all right? So, and most of you got that right. So, here's the answer, 10,000 to 1. Um, next question. True or false? Oh, my goodness, I got the spinning beach ball. The spinning beach ball of death. Fifteen seconds starting right now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, let's see what you guys got here. Uh oh. We got some splaining to do. Uh, including a few that voted for maybe. All right. Now, all right. So before I grade that one, let's just, uh, well, I'll give you the answer here. It is false. Now, now let's take a look at, let's take a look at what we got here. All right. The, shh, shh, shh. I measured out the pixels between wave fronts for this sketch. This is a slice of my uh, Wednesday sketching. All right, so it's about 43 pixels for lambda. All right, that's that line segment there. All right. Now, 10,000 to 1 means that my uh, the, the diameter of my ball bearing has got to be 430,000 pixels, all right? Now, I can't do that on my computer. I tried it, and it wouldn't let me do it. So here's what I was able to do. This is uh, D over lambda equal to 200, and that's, that's the ball bearing. That's 200. That's 50 times smaller than... what it should be. That's, as bi that's not as big as I could make it, but it's almost as big. Now, look how flat that looks, all right? And that's just uh, D over lambda equals 200. All right now, we to make this really to scale, I have to use pretty much a straight line there instead of – you can see the curve in that ball bearing, that gray ball bearing. And uh, But this one – So you can see that, again, this idea that the size of the object or the, you know, whatever your containment device is uh, relative to your incoming wavelength. By the way, what's the uh, uh, 2.2 nanometers? Uh, what flavor of electromagnetic radiation is that? 2.2 nanometers. I mean, it's not it's not a Roy G. Biv, but what is it? What? No, it's not gamma rays, but it, it's it's X rays. It's hard. It's hard X rays. All right. Couple of nanometers, you're talking X rays. All right. Now I want a we're gonna do a demonstration now. And we're gonna try to do it. You know, one thing I don't like about this class is if you don't, if you have a demonstration, you can't, not everybody can see it. All right, now you're going to do part of this. 
I need one volunteer from the audience. Now you're not going to do anything cool like your hair standing on it, but I need one civilian volunteer other than Thomas because you've already done a lot. Somebody that has a volunteer. Okay, Brad, come on up. All right. And what I want you to do is take the slinky. Now, you may have to stand up to see this. Maybe not. Okay. I want you to grab one end. And, Brad, you grab, grab the other. All right. Now, um, Brad, your job, pull, pull, get some, pull it so that it's, bring, reel it in a little bit more, Brad. Yeah. Reel it in a little more. Okay, good. Now, Brad, what you're going to do, Brad's got one end of this slinky. You know what we're going to have to do? We're going to do the demonstration this way, and then we're going to uh, do a rotation by 90 degrees, pi over 2, and somewhere here, and then so that everybody over here can see it. All right, so what Brad's – so, Brad, you keep it stable. So use two hands because you're going to – it's going to – when when uh, Andrew starts oscillating, your hand's going to start oscillating too. It's going to communicate momentum to you. So just keep it ultra solid. Right now, Andrew, I want you to uh, get me the fundamental mode. All right. So slowly, uh, put your hand on the coil. Don't use the rope. Yeah. Use your hand. Okay. Now you're going to oscillate slowly so that we get. All right. There's the fundamental mode. It's either it goes from a bump to a dip. All right. Go ahead and make a sketch of that in your notes. Fundamental mode. Ground state, if you're talking atoms and stuff. Molecular systems. And Brad's doing a really great job over here. Takes a lot of skill, obviously. Okay, now um Go ahead. Uh, can Nick uh, and you guys in there, uh, Cassandra, can you move and, and let Andrew go and rotate 90 degrees down the down the alley there? Can you guys move a little bit? Can you guys move a little bit? Yeah. All right. All right. Now you guys over here on this side that couldn't really see it good. Okay. Get me the fundamental mode. All right. And actually, I think we'll just stay there because I think everybody can see things from that. All right, so there's the fundamental mode. It, op it oscillates between a bump and a dip. But guess what? The waves are actually traveling. What's happening is Bra um, Andrew is emitting an oscillation. So it's going towards Brad. But then Brad is holding it steady. It's reflecting from Brad's hand, and a wave starts going back. Now, where they meet in the middle, you get interference. And at this frequency, make a note, very specific frequency, and therefore very specific wavelength. Matter of fact, this is, this is lambda over 2. The distance between Brad and Andrew, go ahead and write this down. The distance between Brad and Andrew is lambda over 2 for the fundamental mode. Now we're going to we're going to get the first excited state here in just a second. All right. We'll go ahead and write that. You know, this distance, you know, whatever it is, it's about 15 feet. 5 meters. Something like that. That's that's lambda over 2 for the fundamental mode. For this spring and for this level of tension in it and stuff, it depends on a lot of factors. Andrew. First excited state, please. And notice he doesn't he, – he, it's, it's all – come on, Andrew, get the right frequency. Ah, there it is. All right, so that's a bump and a dip oscillating with a dip and a bump. So now the same distance between these two jokers, but that's one lambda. This is the first excited state. Okay, go ahead and write that down. First excited state, distance D is equal to 1 lambda. And notice the – make a note to yourself, 
frequency is larger. Now we could time it if we wanted to. Matter of fact, let's do that. Um, let me get my, go ahead and get your, your uh, actually that's too fast to count. We'll do the ground state when we, we to make a timing. This one's going to be a little bit too fast. But anyways, it's a higher frequency, smaller period, higher, bigger frequency. Andrew, can you get me the next excited state? Change that frequency. Make this, yeah, there we go. Oh, baby. All right, now this is a bump, a dip, and a bump. Oscillating with a dip, a bump, and a dip. Third excited state. So the distance between Andrew and Brad is what? No. That distance, how many waves have you got? No, you don't have three. You, no, you don't have two and a half. One and a half. All right, so that's three lambda over two. All right, so now that so this is this is what we call the second excited state, okay, or the third harmonic. I mean, if this was acoustic engineering or electrical engineering, they call that the third harmonic. All right, now it depends. So go ahead and make a sketch of that. All right, now go ahead and get take a break. Now we're up. No, no, you're not done. I just said take a take your take a break. All right. You just changed the tension, Brad. Nice going. No, you just you're changing it again. Every time you, you should have kept your hands still. Because now we got a different, it's going to bloop things up. Uh, I'm going to record this on my phone for posterity. Okay, Andrew, get the fundamental mode, please. See, it's a little bit faster than before, right, Andrew? You, you agree, Andrew? All right, Andrew, first excited state. First confusion, there it is. First excited state, a little bit higher frequency. Now, from this uh, video, we're going to be able to – okay, thanks, fellas. Now you're done. Yeah, you're done. You're done. Yeah. Brad. Let's give Brad and, and Andrew a hand. Now, I'm going to post this in YouTube somehow. And from that, you'll be able to, um, at that tension level and that distance, you'll be able to calculate uh, frequency and even maybe a wave. If you do a little trig. One more thing, fellas. Can you go back to the same spots where you were standing? Cassandra, can you take a, a meter stick and measure along the floor? Okay, Brad, you stand where you were standing. Andrew, you stand where you were standing. Okay, so we'll just get it to the nearest uh, tenth of a meter. Okay, so from the so from his toes. Two. Three, three point what? Three point six two? Three point five two meters. Okay, go ahead and write that down. Three point five two meters. And we have that distance. Then we, we can from the video we can get the period, therefore the frequency. Here we could figure the, the speed of propagation. That'll be a, ooh, a homework assignment, Dr. B. You know what? That's definitely going to be on the homework this weekend. Yeah, definitely. 3.52. What was it? 3.52? Okay, 3.52 meters. Yeah, you could do it. But you're going to have to observe really carefully. And... You guys, uh, just go ahead and make a note for your, your homework. What you're going to want to do is like count a whole number of oscillations for the fundamental. 
you know, like, and time it. You know, so count five oscillations, time it, and then divide by five, and that'll be your period. Or however, and then do the same thing for the first excited state. And what you'll find is two different periods, but you should find uh, the same uh, V, the same wave speed, lambda F. All right, Cassidy. Yeah. Count the number of os count five oscillations, for instance, and then divide by five, or time out five oscillations. So you'll have to buzz back and forth through the video a couple times, you know, to get it just right. But you know, you should be because the you know YouTube it's all timed, all right? So you can just read the progress bar for the timing. You don't even have to use a stopwatch. Matter of fact, you can step through YouTube, I believe. I don't know. I can't remember how to do that, but hmm, this is going to be easy homework. Doggone it. I'd rather have nice brain burner homeworks, but that's coming. All right, let's talk about Max Planck and black body theory. Now, Max Planck was a German scientist had a big old mustache and everything like those Germans, like Kaiser Wilhelm and those guys. Uh, about 100 years, actually 120 years ago now. And a black body is a, a made-up word for, in physics, a theoretical object that is a perfect absorber of radiation. So and, and it, so it doesn't it absorbs everything it doesn't reflect anything so it doesn't have a color, right? And it's also a perf therefore a perfect emitter if it stays at a certain temperature. So if you have a, an object that's a, a black body at a certain stable temperature, it emits it it absorbs whatever comes into it and then re-emits it as radiation, right? Now, nobody was able to figure out the theory of these perfect emitters until Max Planck came up with his theory. So we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, as a, as a prelude to that, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, spectrum of hydrogen. Now, here's H alpha over here. We've talked about that a number of times. And um, here's H beta, H gamma, and H delta. All right. Now... Um, you can do a little bit of trig, line spacing, we've already done it, with the fraction gratings and get a, a wavelength for all these lines, okay? And this, go ahead and make a note of it. This set of four lines in the, in the Roy G. Biv part of the spectrum is called the Balmer series, okay? And after the guy that figured out the, the pattern, and because, you know, you have this you have this question you know here are all your different you know wavelengths and stuff and the frequencies you can calculate that in terahertz if you want and we've actually done that for a few of them but why doesn't hydrogen put out a continuous spectrum like a you know like a hot light bulb why isn't it continuous why isn't it a rainbow and, or another way to put it why only these four colors and no others so the question arises, you know, you're looking, you can measure all this stuff. You know, you just do a little trig with H and, and L and get your thetas and everything and get your wavelengths like we did in class on Wednesday. But what's the pattern? I mean, look at it. It's not frequency doubling. It's not wavelength doubling. You know, it's not divided by two, divided by three. It's, you know, it doesn't seem to be anything simple, all right? But what the inherent conviction is that there has to be some unseen uh, regularity in the atom, you know, because this is from hydrogen atoms. And there's a pattern. It's got to reveal, it's got to be a revelation. Now, we don't, you know, uh, those guys in the 1800s that were looking at this, you know, they couldn't figure it out. They, they were convinced that there was something about the atom, but they couldn't figure it out. 
All right. So the question is, what kind of pattern is it? Is it frequency doubling? No. Is it wavelength doubling? No. Uh, is it uh, inverse frequency squared? You know, is it like the inverse square law? No, it's not that. Um, but here's what um, Professor Balmer found out. He was a mathematician, actually. He said that the pattern comes out in the inverse wavelength. And it comes into a very famous pattern called the Balmer formula, right? Now, here's another um, column to put on your table, right? Fifth column, there's your one over, your inverse wavelength. All right. And actually, that should be 10 to the minus 9 meters, I believe. Um, instead of 10 to the 9, I'll have to correct that. Uh, 0 0.00152. 0 0.00206, 0 0.0023, 0 0.00244. All right, now Balmer was looking at that, and then I have no I Does that look like a pattern to you? It doesn't to me either, but guess what? Balmer, you know, used mental X-ray vision. This is the pattern. There's a constant out in front, but then the numerical pattern. Remember, these things are countable. So there's a, a number n. And he said, look, if, if red corresponds to the number 3, and then I do 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 3 squared, um, I always get the same constant, r. And if you do the same thing for 4, 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 4 squared, it all works out to the inverse wavelength. And, you know, Balmer must have been some kind of subterranean genius from another planet or something. Uh, you know, I would have never thought of this. But he did, and it worked. And the constant R, uh, you got it written down there? Actually, it's, it's on the next page here. Constant R is called the Rydberg constant. All right? And for hydrogen, the value is approximately 1.097 times 10 to the 7 inverse meters, meters to the minus 1. All right. Now, we get all that data from diffraction gratings and looking at the spectrum of hydrogen through a diffraction grating. Right? So it's not double slit. It's like a zillion slit diffraction. But, you know, it's nice, and we get the wavelengths very nicely similar to how we did it on a Wednesday, all right? So what happens for n equals 7? Well, you put in 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over n squared, 1 over 7 squared, and then you calculate. And then you get your answer, and then you flip-flop it, and that'll be your lambda, all right? So here's – go ahead and write that down. Write down the Rydberg constant because you're going to do a calculation here. Go ahead and hit the refresh button on your calculator, and uh, here's our calculation. Do the n equals 7. These are photons that you're looking at. So this is the wavelength of the photon for n equals 7 using the Balmer formula. Don't forget to flip-flop your calculation from 1 over lambda to lambda itself. Okay, so now hit the refresh key and, and then type in this, type in like 887 or whatever your answer is and hit the send key. All right, I want the nearest nanometer. Go ahead and circulate around. So we have a table, n equals 3, 4, 5, 6. So the next level in the table is n equals 7. That's what we're doing. And we're gonna we're gonna find it very close to n equals six because they're both pretty much purpley violet lines. And I'll give you a, a few minutes. It's kind of dipsy. If you're if you're doing it on your calculator, you can just do it, you know, with brute force. But if you're doing it on paper, you have to use common denominators and stuff. It's kind of a pain in the boop.
Okay, I see you guys using your iPads over there this afternoon, this morning. Good. Now I see it. Yeah, so something, 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 and hit the send bar, send key. you take a nice dark marker over to that board by the defibrillator and write in gigantic letters TGIF. Cheer everybody up. Ninety seconds, one and a half minutes, starting right now. Thank you, Andrew. You know what the alternate meaning for TGIF is? No. The alter, yeah, the, you know, thank God it's Friday. That's the, that's the normal meaning. But the other meaning is for people that have difficulty putting on their shoes. Toes going first. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen it on the internet a couple times, you know. Some guy looking in his shoes, TGIF, toes going first. Can you put video on Instagram? See the thing, it cuts it off. But you can see, you can see, Brad, I'm putting your thing in Instagram, but unfortunately, it cuts you off except for your hands. But the hands are the only thing you were doing. Oh my goodness, that was fast. Is it already up on YouTube, the video? Or, or on uh, uh, Instagram? It's really fast. Uh, okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good. Um, Yeah, 90% uh, of you got this right. Uh, the answer is uh, 397. 
Uh, and let's just go over the uh, solution for that. Um, all right, so here's your, here's your Balmer formula. One over lambda equals the Rydberg constant times square brackets, one over two squared minus one over seven squared. All right, now that's the same as this, uh, 0 0.25 minus 0 0.020408. Or you can use common denominators if you're, you know, if you if you really like fractions a lot. And I, I can see a lot of people smiling when I say that, so it's your prerogative. But anyways, there you go. Uh, 0 0.22959. Everything's positive, which is good. We get a, po a positive wavelength. All right, so 1 over lambda is equal to 0 0.025186 times 10 to the 7. Inverse meters. Now that's the that's one over lambda. All right, that's not that's a wave number. That's not the wavelength. All right, to get the wavelength, you got to flip flop that baby. All right, so don't forget to flip flop it. And most of you did that. It's one over uh, the result, and that's three point nine seven times ten to the minus seven meters, which is the same as three ninety seven. All right, so technically that's below 400 nanometers. I don't know, maybe some of you in here that are visiting from Dr. Xavier's school for, what what is it now? Gifted Youngsters. If, if you're on, if you're on an academic exchange from Dr. Xavier's, maybe you can see it. Anyway, so that's that's hard violet or or soft ultraviolet. So the Balmer series, um, you know, that's the pattern. Now let's try one for another series. It's the Lyman series. This one um, has a different sequence. Um, Instead of 1 over 2 squared, it's 1 over 1 squared, or just 1, all right? And this is the Lyman series, all right? And this is a set of ultraviolet lines, all right? So here's your calculation. Uh, calculate the n equals 2 line. This is the Lyman alpha. You know, you can't have n equals 1. You have to have n equals 2. All right, so it's a numeric. Go ahead and uh, make your calculation. Okay, the question is started. And here are some images that are, are shown in uh, using Lyman alpha light. Same object, just different wave wavelengths. And let me try to calculate that because I forgot the answer. What is Rydberg? One, oh, there it is. You use it, you make your measurement, and then you see if it fits. Okay, so what they, so basically what this is doing is it's, it's recovering a theory this is like a theory. This is the mathematics of a theory for the uh, spectrum of hydrogen. So they've already got all the measurements in there. And they find that some of the ultraviolet lines fall into this pattern, some of the Roy G. Bivs into the Balmer series pattern. And there's a few other series uh, that we can look at. 
uh, but that's the way you, you work it. So you basically do this. What, what we do is we have a very, very precise measurement of the uh, Rydberg constant. And then we plug in the numbers we want to get the wavelengths of a certain series. It all has to do with the atomic physics of, of hydrogen, so which we'll get to directly. Would I expect you to do what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Um, let's see. Um, one over two squared is a fourth. So one minus a fourth is three fourths. So the square brackets are just simple, three over four. So R times 3 divided by 4 equals, I forget, 1 over that is equal. Now, what I got was 121.54 nanometers, which is 122 if you round up to the nearest meters. Uh, here's somebody with a little bit of problems, uh, powers of 10 here. And I don't know what this other one is. But anyway, it's pretty good. Oh, okay. So, um, anyways, good job on that. Let's keep going. Now, let's talk about Planck now. And this is, let me get this out of the way here. Um, this, is, this is the theoretical spectrum of a 5,800 Kelvin object like our star, the sun. Now, what this means is, is that right up here at the top of this top of this curve? Now this is a curve made with really fancy exponential functions. All right, now I'm not going to write it down, but it has this property. There's a central bump, and then it dips off to the low wavelengths. Okay, so this is ultraviolet down here. By the way, the wavelength unit here is angstroms, which is ten times smaller than. Uh, oh my leg! Oh my goodness! Oh, I'm, I'm never okay, my friend. I'm in, always in pain, but just keep going. Anyways, so this is ultraviolet down here. Here's visible from 4,000 to 7,000 angstroms. Okay, so go ahead and make a sketch of this. All right? And this is the ultraviolet end down here, and this is the infrared end over here. All right? Now, if that's for something as hot as the surface or the photosphere of the sun, which is about 5,800 Kelvin. All right now, if you're if you're um, a human at about 98.6 Fahrenheit, your peak is way down in the infrared, and it's much shorter. The size of this curve also is controlled by the temperature. You know, so it's, it's a very complex curve. Now. This is something that people had measured. You can measure the intensity in the lab, and I have done this for different uh, wavelengths at different temperatures. You just write it down, you know. So you put your photometer up there. Okay, how much juice do I get out of my photometer? That indicates the brightness, right? And then you change to a different color. Okay, you put a different uh, filter on. You know, you measure the brightness for that. And you, you measure up all your brightnesses. For colors and they, they map out onto this line All right now that's the uh, experimental observation now Planck nobody could come up with a theoretical explanation of that you know like they thought of you know they thought of irradiation they, they knew that the source of the uh, electromagnetic field was accelerating electrons and protons 
So they thought, all right, what kind of what kind of things have we got that are oscillating in an object? So they so they were thinking about spring systems, and which was nice. They were thinking about oscillators, and the fast, the hotter it is, the more oscillation you get, et cetera, et cetera, on average. All right. And so they could say, well, you know, if I'm at 5,800, I'm going to have a lot of oscillators um, operating at this wavelength and or, or generating light at this wavelength and this because they have a certain frequency. So, that, you know, you can do a, a, a graph of this thing instead of wavelength. Uh, you could use frequency across the bottom. All right. And you could do. And so the, the whole thing was, what are these oscillators doing? How do they work? You know, they're not like spring systems. You don't want to have kx squared. You know, what's the energy of these oscillators? Because, you know, the, the, the hotter, the more average energy is. You know, if you're thinking about a gas, the bigger the temperature, the higher the average kinetic energy is for the gas. All right. And so if you're thinking about something solid like a black body, perfect radiator, perfect absorber, you know, OK, it's it's not springs. It's not a gas, but something's oscillating. But we can't. They couldn't get it. So make a note here. Nobody could figure out the dip on the ultraviolet side. Every theory just kept on going up. Nothing dipped back down to zero like this one. This is Planck's theory, right? And this is also the observation. So Planck's theory and the observation met. met. They, they, they reconciled. And then there was another theory that said, oh, yeah, okay, this other theory, uh, it dips down here, low ultraviolet side and up through the, through the visible, but then it keeps going up in the infrared. You know, we got, they had a theory that's good on ultraviolet, but falls apart for infrared. They have a, a theory that, another theory, good for infrared, but it falls apart for ultraviolet. But nobody could get dips on both sides, except for Max Planck. So here's what his theory was. What he assumed was that there were uh, quantized oscillations and only certain quanta, uh, in fact, the energy was um, a, a constant, the oscillator frequency uh, times a constant. Now, this is uh, a constant, the symbol, the, the um, customary symbol is H. That's Planck's constant. That's a picture of Max Planck right there. And he said, all right, if I, if I make my oscillators in my solid, you know, black body, you know, only have certain fr frequencies and certain bundles of, so the frequency was, or so the energy would only come in certain frequencies and certain bindles of this size, uh, then he could get that curve to, to dip on, on the ultraviolet side and the infrared side. So, in this formula, energy is in joules or electron volts, um, and H in joules is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. The frequency of the oscillator is in hertz, of course. And I had a when I when I was in grad school, I was taking uh, electricity and magnetism graduate level. And the professor was this really smart guy from Los Alamos that came up and, and started to lecture at my grad school. And he said one time a, a grad student had, had asked him, or maybe it was an undergraduate, I don't know, but it was somebody that said, well, if, if Planck's constant is so small, why don't you just round it off to zero? But if you, <laughs> if you do that, it doesn't explain anything. So, and but Planck's constant is very small, and that is what on the on our scale. You know, joules is the human scale. Joules, meters, seconds, that's human-sized units of energy. Coulombs, human-sized measure of charge. All right. But in the scale that they were operating, the atomic scale, this is just perfectly big enough. So Planck's constant being small compared to us means that only atoms and electrons and stuff are small enough to obey the rules of quantization visibly, all right? 
Again, this is the, si the difference in the size scales business. All right. Now, after Max Planck came up with that for a, a black body, Einstein said, you know, I think this is how electrons and hydrogen atoms emit photons. And, and actually what he was thinking about was something called the photoelectric effect. He said, look, if, if photons come in specific energies of HF, uh, then the photoelectric theory, the photoelectric effect, which in 1905 was not well understood, uh, became understood. So Einstein said, yeah, let's let's make uh, equals HF for photons, too, because, you know, their, their, their conviction was that photons, particles of light, were os part of an oscillatory system. So, all right, we'll call them particles, but let's give them a frequency. All right. And the frequency that we can calculate from the lab using diffraction gratings and trig, which we could do in this class if we had enough lasers. We could easily do it in here if we had enough lasers. But we don't. So this is the uh, Planck's constant. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of this. And the guy that brought it the next step is this chap on the left, uh, Niels Bohr. He's the one that, he and Einstein together, this is them at some conference, talking about babes, I guess. I don't know what they're talking about. Either that or electrons or something. Yeah, he's smoking, smoking a pipe. Or they're talking, if this was Minnesota, they'd be talking about uh, Ludafisk. The bit. Who, does anybody here know what Ludafisk is? See, you guys are deprived. This is if this was Wisconsin or South Dakota, everybody would know and avoid Ludafisk. It's a I don't even know what it is, but everybody <laughs> hates. It. Anyways, so so nobody knows what they were talking about. Probably talking about photoelectricity and hydrogen atoms or maybe just lutefisk or babes or something. But this guy, this guy on the left, Niels Bohr, was from Denmark. And this is a conference over in uh, Belgium, I think, is where this was taken. And those were two big shots. That's like. Chuck Norris and. Bruce Lee of physics right there, pretty much. And they were figuring out the quantum theory of hydrogen. But the guy that really brought it all home and connected it to Brad's and Andrew's demonstration is this guy, Louis de Broglie. And we'll talk about him next week. So keep reading as much as you can about Planck's constant and the atomic physics of hydrogen. I'll see you next week. We'll dismiss early. If you want to talk about your grades, we have a few minutes.